school. And we, every day we watch the news and we look at things in politics and economics and science and everything. We go through the whole gamut. And what I'm seeing, I, I see more news now than I ever did before because I'm, we're looking at all the different channels and what each channel says differently and all those kind of things. As we're going through and looking at all this stuff, the one thing that I see the most is uncertainty. Everybody's wondering what's going to happen next. Everybody's trying to come up with, oh, this will happen or that will happen and all sorts of things. And again, as the media does, I think it's encouraging fear through all of us. And I want to talk about that a little bit today. And I want to talk about it maybe in a little bit different context. But I want to talk about the concept of our faith. So let's just go to the Lord and as we begin. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I just thank you so much that we have this opportunity to come together and, and get into your word, Lord, that you have your word out, laid out for us so that we can draw closer and closer to you through it. And I just, I thank you for everyone that's here today, Lord, and I just pray that you give me the words that you want spoken. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, I'm going to start off, like I said, everything's kind of uncertain in our day right now, but I'm going to start off with a, a passage from Mark. And it's a story with Jesus and his healing, but there's a unique feature in this one. So, Mark 9, 14 through 19. When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing about with them? He asked. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought my son who was possessed by a spirit that was robbed of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. You unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered, it has thrown him into the fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, Jesus said, everything is possible for one who believes. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my disbelief, my unbelief. This is an interesting passage from the Bible because we see Jesus and he, he heals this young, young boy. But we see Jesus here and we see that the disciples were not able to throw this demon out. And I didn't complete this passage, but later on Jesus explains that only through prayer can this one, could this type of demon be thrown out. So when the, Jesus is confronted with this, he does something unique. He hasn't done this before. He turns to the Father. He turns to the father of this child and says, how long has this been going on? And the father says, if you can. And Jesus kind of rebukes him a little bit and says, if you can, well, anything is possible for those that believe. And the father's response there, I think, is just absolutely beautiful. He says, help me overcome my disbelief. When I look at this, I think of, the, of this father and I think, you know what? He says, this has been going on since childbirth. How many times do you think he's been praying to God for this healing? He's been praying. He's been concerned about his son enough to bring him to Jesus later on, but he's been praying since birth with this, with this boy. And it hasn't happened yet. And we don't know why it didn't happen. Possibly just because God wanted this in the word. And he said, okay, I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait and let Jesus heal him so you guys can see this concept. But he says, help me with my unbelief. And a lot of times, if we have gone long enough under certain circumstances, we say, well, this is the way God wants it, I guess. This is just the way it's going to be. This is what's going to happen. This is how it is for me. And we start thinking that we are not going to, nothing's going to change because it hasn't changed right now. And that when he says, help my unbelief, help me to overcome my unbelief, I think that's what he's talking about. I've tried for so long. I've thought about this for so long. I've prayed about it for so long that I just, I threw it out there to your disciples and said, could you help them? And it didn't help. 
That man admitted what I think we all go through at times, and we all go through those situations where our faith is dampened. It's pushed down a little bit. And Satan loves to do that. He loves to whisper in our ear, well, you know, you're not really ready for this. You're not good enough. You're not really a good speaker, so maybe you should keep your mouth shut. You're not trained enough to do something. You're not um, ready for these kind of things. You're not gifted with that. And God says, oh, no, 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 no. That's not true. Satan loves to tamper, tamper us down and separate us from God by throwing cold water on our faith. But there's something we can do about that. So let's look at what faith is first. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and insurance about what we do not see. There's a couple of descriptions there. Faith is confidence. Confidence in what we're, we hope for. Believe that God's got this. He's going to take care of it. God said it, so it is. That's the way it works. Our faith should be that, that strong in that. And also, assurance about what we do not see. We don't know what's going on in the spiritual world. We don't know. We have no idea what's, what God is doing in the spiritual world just because we can't see it. But if we understand, if we have the faith to understand that God is working, then we can overcome that. The concept that we can't see it. Matthew 21, 2 says, If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. Now, God's not McDonald's. You don't pull up to the drive thru and pray and get what you want. They don't hand it, you know. There are times when you will have an immediate answer from God, and there's times when there will be uh, God's will is that it takes a little longer, but God is always working on it. And if we come to Him earnestly in prayer, God is working on those things. Things are going to happen because of that. In addition, Hebrews eleven six 6 says, Without faith it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. We have to believe. Faith means we have to believe that what God said is true. And what God said is going to happen. We believe that. That's what faith is. Faith is one of those challenging things in us is that in that we don't really understand everything, but God gives us all we need. He gives us what we need to have faith. And that's why it's so strange to the world. The world doesn't understand the fact that we believe that God's working even though we don't see it necessarily. We believe that God is doing things for us all the time, whether someone else sees it or not. It's easy to see someone who is blessed physically or financially or something like that. It's easy for the world to see that. They may not recognize it as a blessing, but they see that. What they don't see are the things, the small things that are happening, the little things that are happening, the things that happen on the inside of us. Faith is simple, but it's not automatic. That's what challenges everyone. When, when Jesus said, you know, uh, the, the gospel confounds the wise. It's, it's the faith of children. It's simple like that, but that doesn't mean it's easy. That doesn't mean it's just automatic. I believe in Jesus, so I'm done. No, that's not how that works. Faith has to be worked on. We have to work at increasing our faith. We have to work at increasing that connection with God so that we can see him and hear him and know what's going on. If you take things to God and you pray about it, he'll answer. And when he answers, that increases your faith. If you take things to God and say, God, I would really, I really need this to happen in my life. When it does, you go back to him and praise, your faith grows. The more we use our faith, the stronger it gets. The less we use it, the less accustomed we are to it, the less it's going to do for us. That's how that works. Romans 10, 17 says, Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. I cannot stress this enough. The word is heard. Message is heard through the word about Christ. Right here. You want to hear what God has to say? You got to work at it. You have to read it. You have to get into your Bible. You have to listen to it if you want to listen to it. You have to do something to seek God's word. Because he's speaking. 
Faith comes from hearing the message, hearing God speak to you. That's where your faith comes. We have to work at it. It's not automatic. Romans 8, 28, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Our faith makes that real. I don't know exactly when God, things are going to happen that I pray for, but I know they will. That's the hope that we have as, as believers in Christ. That's the hope that we have, is that no matter what uncertainties in front of us, we have a certainty in God. No matter what we don't know about, no matter what our circumstances are, God is the same yesterday, today, forever. And God is working for your good. He's working for your benefit. He is helping you right now, whether you see it, whether you feel it, whether you understand it, doesn't matter. You just have to know it. God said it, so it is. That's the way it works. God used the word from the very beginning. If you go back to Genesis, God spoke the world into being. He said, let there be light. He said all these things. His word was the most powerful thing that created everything around us. So we have his word in the, in the scripture, so why are we not spending time with that power that's available to us? And again, that will just embolden our faith, it will strengthen our faith, it will make us more of what we could be. Each of us is born with a certain amount of potential in everything we have, in everything we do. We're, we're given talents, we're given strength, we're given knowledge, we're given all these things as we grow but we were born with some possibilities in our lives. As Christians, it's the same way. When you accepted Christ, you were born again, but you are, at that point in time, a baby. And you need to grow up. We need to be educated. We need to get stronger. We need to grow in our faith. It's not just flipping a switch. You have to grow in your faith. And that takes consistent effort. And that's getting into the work. God's desire is not for us to look to look just to look like him on the outside, but on the inside. Think about that concept. We were created in the image of God. But God doesn't want just the physical. You want a true family resemblance? You should be the same on the inside as God. And that's faith. And that's confidence. And that's the assurance that we should have as Christians. When we falter in our faith, when we stumble in our faith, that's not a resemblance of God. How many times do we see Jesus intimidated to speak? Oh yeah, but he had a master's degree in public speaking. For, no, he didn't. He grew up as a carpenter in a small town. But because of his connection with the Father, he had all the confidence to bring that message to us. He had all the confidence to come out and share the word. So what's holding us back? What's stopping us from being that bold? What's stopping us from working in the kingdom the way we've been told to work? Well, it's a lack of faith. When God called Moses and he was speaking to him at the burning bush, he said, well, you know, I'm not good with words. And if you read in your word, it'll say God got angry about that. And he said, who asked you what you're good at? I told you I want you to be my mouthpiece. I said, well, I'll give you your brother Aaron to help, but you, you're the one I'm going to talk to, and then you'll have to go through him. But he was, yeah, it said, God wasn't happy with that concept of, well, I'm not good enough at this. Well, why did I call you if you're not good enough? Why did I say, I'm going to give you everything, and then you say, well, I'm not sure. No. That confidence, that assurance, is something that we get through faith, and God is calling each and every one of us to be working for the kingdom. If you're lacking in confidence, go find it. If you're not sure what God wants you to do, go find it. If you're not sure what you're doing in your life is the right thing, go find it. He wants to talk to you. He wants to speak to you. So how do we add to our faith? Well, 2 Peter 1, 4 through 7 says, through these, through these, he has given us very special and precious promises so that through them, you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this reason, make every effort 
to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and perseverance godliness, and to godliness mutual affection, and to mutual affection love. If you look at this, you start that little seed, that little mustard seed. That's where you start. And to that, you add goodness. But to that, you have to add knowledge. And knowledge comes from God and from seeking his word. That's where knowledge comes from. And when you have the knowledge, well, then you'll have self-control. And if you have that knowledge and that self-control, then you can add on perseverance because your faith will take you through all the rocky parts of life without having to worry about it because your faith is strong enough, because you have enough knowledge of God's words, because you have enough of what he gives you and he gives it freely. And if you have enough perseverance, then you will, that will lead to godliness, mutual affection, and eventually to love. We, if you look at that list, it is this to this to this to this to this. How can we truly love without the knowledge of God? How can we truly love anyone without the knowledge of God? Without the perseverance that we're supposed to have, without that confidence without the wisdom that God gives us, how can we truly love? And that's what he said. You'll know my people by their love. But it says that's a process. So if you don't have something in the middle, how are you going to get to the stuff in the end? It's like a recipe, okay? If you look at a recipe for something, if you have never had some of the bread that Velma makes, all right? She makes some awesome little dessert bread things. Oh, my Lord. He comes to our house and we have a first come, first serve thing. But Jane won't let me just put butter on the loaf and eat it. But if she had that recipe and she started it and she skipped the stuff in the middle and then she put the last two things that were on there and tried to throw it together, it's not going to work. You have to have it all. And the same thing here, Peter is talking about this. He says, you've got to have it all. We've got to go through this process. We've got to work towards it. It's not free, it's not easy, it's not automatic. You have to work towards these things. And as this happens, you grow. And as you grow, you get better and better and better at everything. And finally, you're able to love the way God loves. That's a challenge. So, 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. When Jesus left the Holy Spirit, when he gave us the Holy Spirit, when that came on Pentecost, what did that do to Peter? What did that do to the disciples who were gathered together at that point in time in fear? They were afraid of what was going to happen, what people were going to do to them. And with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, suddenly it exploded. And they were speaking in tongues. And Peter, for the first time, was preaching. And he was coming out. Peter, who we know of, Jesus said, this is the rock I'm going to build my church on. Peter, who was the leader of the early church. Peter, who denied Christ. Suddenly, it came upon him because of the Spirit. And as Paul is saying here in Corinthians, if we with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, if we are seeking to understand, what does contemplate mean? Contemplate something. Well, that's to focus on it, to think on it, to dwell on it, to make it something that we put our lives into. If you're going to truly contemplate something, you're working towards understanding. And he says, when we understand God's glory, that we are transformed. And that comes from the Holy Spirit. So as we draw closer to God, as we draw into what we, what we are meant to be, what he gave us for the purpose of growth, then the Spirit will aid in that and we will get closer and closer to who God wants us to be. Luke twenty two thirty one 31 says, Jesus was speaking to Peter and he says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked, you, has asked to sift you all as wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. And this is right before he says, you're going to deny me three times. 
Jesus knew full well that the human that was sitting in front of him was weak. He was a weak vessel. He couldn't do this on his own. Peter's walking with Christ for three years and, and Jesus says, I know you're not ready. And I know Satan is wanting to just dump you guys all over the place when I leave, but I prayed for you. And when I pray for you, you're going to turn back. And when you turn back, strengthen everyone else. When you get it, add it to others. So if we are not adding to others, do we have it yet? No, maybe not. I grow in the Lord every time I read. I learn new things. It's one of the beauties of the Bible is that it doesn't matter how many times you read it, God gives you something new every single time you read these passages. You can read through the Bible and read the Bible every single day of your life and every day it will be brand new. Every day God will open one more layer on that onion. He'll peel it back a little bit more and you see more and you feel more and you understand more and you hear more. Every time you do that, you get closer to God and your faith increases. I love when we're doing prayer requests and somebody says, oh, I got to praise. That means a lot to me because we're recognizing what God did as we're asking for God to do things, we're also recognizing what he's already done. And those things are amazing. Those things are amazing. Harold is sitting here and I'm standing here and we're, we're praying for us to lose the, the oxygen bottles. Lose our oxygen so that we can go on like we were before. But guess what? The fact that we're here at all is praise. Amen. The fact that we're here at all is a miracle that God did that he didn't have to do, but he did. And I personally believe a lot of that came from prayer. People prayed, and it happened. And I think every one of us can look in our own lives and see times where God did things for us that I might not even know what I was praying for. The Bible says the Spirit knows the groaning of your heart and can actually transmit that to God. But there are so many things in my life that have been blessings that I didn't know I had coming down the pike. I didn't know what was going on. When I came here, I had no idea what I was doing. When I first started coming up here in Pulpit Supply High, I had no idea. I've told this story before. Um, I got the call when I was standing at an auction. I got a phone call and said, hey, I want you to do Pulpit Supply. I've never done it before. Uh, send you up to Dupree. I don't know where that is. Well, look it up on the map. It's not that far away. Okay. Fifteen minutes later, I get another call. Well, Dupree's at nine, Eagle Butte's at eleven. Can you do them both? And then, God bless him, he went in this long, detailed story about how don't do what someone did before. Don't go out about three hundred dollars of of country western gear and think you need to go up there like that. He said, just wear jeans, that's what they wear. I said, okay, that's good, that's what I wear too, it works out. So, as that happened, as I started, I went in there with fear and my first thought was, I don't know if I'm gonna be good at this. I'd been a teacher, I'd been a speaker before, but I'm not sure about this. And it, pro it progressed and it progressed and it progressed. And one of the blessings that happened out of that is I got focused in the Word even stronger than I had ever been before because I knew I was going to stand in front of people so I had to get some work done. I had to be prepared if I'm going to do something like this. And when the time came that I was called into full-time ministry, I went to God and said, God, I don't think I'm ready for this. I don't think I have the ability... I don't think I have the knowledge. I don't think I have the training. And God said, well, who's asking? Are you willing to do it? If you're willing to do it, I'll take care of the rest. You just have to step out there and I'll take care of the rest. And he has to this day. And God asks each of us to step out there. And don't wait until, well, I, I have to wait until I feel like I'm ready. No, God says, go, go. Because he'll provide everything else. And that's faith. That's true faith. When you can step out knowing that God's got this. God's got control of this. It's going to happen. When I jumped out of airplanes and 
we'd be up in the air and there'd be 150 people in an airplane and they open up doors on either side of the plane and everybody just runs out into open space. The only reason we did that is because we had enough training to understand that the parachute's going to open when you're out there. If not, you got a spare, you can open yourself, but you just do that. Somebody somewhere packed that thing all together and put it in a bag that's supposed to open when you leave. And you get to the point where you just have faith that it's going to happen. You step out. Well, for goodness sakes, if human beings can jump out of perfectly good airplanes, I think we can step out and say something to other, some other people. I think we can go out and witness for God. I think we can go out and work in the way that God wants us to work. That's a smaller leap, I think, than jumping out of an airplane. And God has talked to me through that too. And he said, well, look at what I've let you do all your life. Look at where I've led you. Look at who I've put in your life. Why do you think you won't have that if you do what I ask? So I want us to all think about this right, right now. I, I, I want us to just put this all together. God is at work right now. You may not see it, but that's faith. You may not know what he's going to do, but that's faith. God's working for your good, and God is working all the time. Real Job 33, 14, God always answers one way or another, even when people don't recognize his presence. I love that passage, that God's still working for you. <laughs> you're going to miss out on some of the blessing if you're not listening, but he answers us. He answers us. He continues to answer our prayers. And that is something that we should be able to grab a hold of and make part of our faith is that God's working for us right now. John 5, 17 says, In his defense, Jesus said, My Father is always at his work to this very day, and I too am working. They challenged him and said, Well, you shouldn't be working on this day. You should be working on the Sabbath. You should be. He says, God's always working. Who are, you going to, who are you to tell me when I can and when I can't? Who are you to tell me that I should or I shouldn't? No. My Father is always working, and I'm always working. Well, guess what? As children of God, we should always be working too. How many of you, I mean, just about everybody in here has a rural upbringing, right? How many of you ever grew up in the way that your parents would be out working in the fields, in the bad, working cattle, doing whatever, and you sat in the house? I ain't right, allowed. Well, when it's time to work, everybody pitches in. Everybody puts their hands into it. And that's normal. We take that into ourselves and we say, that's a normal thing. Everybody, the family works together. Well, our Father in Heaven is working. And our brother and his son, Jesus Christ, is working. What makes us think we get to sit on the couch? God says, believe in me. I'm working. I want you to work too. Get out there. Get to work. Philippians 2.13 says, for it is God who works in you, you to will, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. You don't have to wait until you're ready. God's going to work in you. We don't have to wait until everything falls into place. God's doing all that. It's all falling into place right now, whether you see it or not, whether you know it or not. Whether you're aware of it or not, it's happening. Everything is falling into place so you can work the way God wants you to work in his kingdom right now, right here. It's all happening. And our faith is stepping out saying, I don't know the words, but I know you will give them to me when the time comes. I don't know how this person needs help, but you will give them when the time comes. If we are truly to look like God on the inside as well on the out, that faith should be what people judge us by, not by our appearance, Martin Luther King, in his I Have a Dream speech, said, I, I dream of a day when my children are judged by the content of their character, not the color of their skin. And skin doesn't matter, it's what's inside. It's the same thing. God wants us to reflect him from the inside out, not from the outside. You can wear all the t-shirts you want. You can have all the bumper stickers that you want. You could put all the signs up you want. doesn't mean a single thing unless it's coming from the inside. You can decorate your house with everything that Hobby Lobby has that says praise God, but if you're not praising God on the inside, it's worthless. 
It needs to come from the inside. So, I'm going to finish with this. 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. Be steadfast, immovable, and abounding in the work of the Lord. Understanding that everything you're doing is backed by God. How's that for a guarantee? God gives his promise that he will do that for us. God gives his promise that he will not stop working for us. When you hire a contractor, or you hire a builder, you always look for one that's kind of got a backing to him, right? That's got something in him. A bonded person, someone who has a guarantee behind it that something's going to work. You get a loan, you have to give collateral. Guess who's our collateral? God. So if you're stepping out beyond where you're supposed to be, God's the one's backing you up. And he doesn't let us fall. He doesn't let us fail. That's our faith. That's our hope. And that's where we need to push ourselves to now. And that is something we can work on every single day to continue to be steadfast, to be immovable, and to be abounding in the work of the Lord. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much for your word today. I thank you for your son that you loved us so much that you sent him to teach and to live and to heal and to die and to be resurrected by you in a, in a foretaste of what's going to happen with us. And Lord, I know that Jesus just worked tirelessly he worked and worked and worked here on the earth to do these things, to teach us, to, to lead us to you. And Father, I just pray that in, in like manner, Lord, that we work and work and work to lead others to you, to continue to spread your word, to continue to share the gospel, to step into leadership roles, to step into places that, you know what, I'm not overly comfortable, but I'll give it my best shot. Knowing that God's standing right behind you saying, all you have to do is be willing. Take care of the rest. Father, you are the provider of our strength. You are the provider of our faith. You are the author of our faith. And you have never left us alone. Father, just speak to us. I ask that you just speak to each and every one of us. You convict us in the, in the ways that we should go and what we should be doing. That you convict each and every one of us right down to the roots of our soul of where we should be and who we should be right now, right here. Because I know you got work for us. I know you have things for us to do, Lord. And sometimes you put it right in front of us and we don't see it. But Lord, just convict us to get closer to your word so we can hear the whisper and don't have to wait for the shout. That we can be all that you want us to be. Father, I just ask that you bless each and every one of us that you hold us in the palm of your hand. And I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.